Additional films of the landing on Mindoro. The convoy and beachhead are under constant air attack. Survivors from a burning ship are picked up. Supplies go ashore. Filipinos volunteer their aid to speed the unloading of high-octane gasoline. Also pitching in are men of an airfield construction squad, Australian sailors and Yank soldiers. Number 605 unloads while Jap planes try to stop the flow of materiel to shore. Number 605 damaged by a nearby Jap plane crash. The plane hit a fuel dump on shore, the impact showering the bow of the ship with gasoline and parts of the plane. Engineers operate the narrow gauge railroad from San Jose to the Kamanawit Point Wharf, one of our landing areas. The railroad now services our inland supply line as troops push beyond San Jose. Founded in 1912 to haul sugar cane, the railroad ceased operation when the Japs took over in February 1942. San Jose Airfield. A fighter strip is being built by American and Australian aviation engineers. Completed, this strip will be 6,000 by 100 feet. The strip was named for Colonel Hill, killed during Mindoro landing operations. The first plane lands on the new strip, base for future air operations against enemy installations on Luzon, Formosa, and the South China coast. A Jap plane shot down on Mindoro. The impact digs a crater 24 feet across and 14 feet deep. One of our P-38s makes a crash landing. The pilot was rescued from the flames by a communications officer. An Arctic skyway for sending U.S. lend-lease planes to Russia. This map traces the route from Great Falls, Montana, U.S. terminus to Siberia via Edmonton, Watson Lake, Whitehorse, Fairbanks, and Nome. Edmonton, capital of Alberta, first big Canadian link in the chain of air bases known as the Northwest Staging Route. To sustain operation, food, furniture, and other items are flown to various key points. The route is to Russia what flying the hump has been to China. North to the Yukon. Originating as part of Canada's wartime airway expansion, the route was offered free to the U.S. as an airway to Alaska. One of more than 20 air bases and emergency landing fields. Here, RCAF crews complete installations. Canada's investment in U.S. built facilities is over $39 million. Speeding extension of the airway to meet Russia-bound traffic. The Arctic route was chosen in 1935 after years of pioneering by Canadian bush pilots. Operations are under the 7th Ferrying Group and the Alaskan position of the Air Transport Command. U.S. Ambassador to Canada, Ray Atherton, greeted by Lieutenant Colonel Fagan and RCAF Air Vice Marshal Lawrence. Planes for Russia at Fairbanks, Alaska. The first Russia-bound planes flew over the Arctic Airway in September 1942. As of December 1944, more than 5,000 planes have gone to the Soviet Union via this route. 
Veteran combat pilots of the Red Air Force, ready to take over from American pilots for the last lap of the flight to Siberia. Off to a base in Siberia, 540 miles from Fairbanks, or more than 2,000 miles from the assembly line. on 30th November advance on Pinway, 174 miles north of Mandalay. Major General Francis W. Festing is in command. The Chinese 155 battery is commanded by an American liaison officer. A Scottish unit moves up. The retreating enemy elected to fight for Penway, and the stubborn resistance cost many Japanese lives. It's St. Andrew's Day, holiday of Scotland's patron saint, so a pipe major leads the way as they occupy the area south of the Penway Railroad Station. British sappers reenact discovery of an improvised Jap road mine south of Penway. A small board is found beneath a loose covering of twigs and earth. The mine is a pressure type with a two pound charge of picric acid. The striker is a ten penny nail. It and the coil springs are the only metal used. Another mine with the same charge was activated by a trip wire. To facilitate supply for allied columns pursuing the retreating Japs, engineers repair a section of the Mogong Mandalay Railroad leading south from Penway. As the allies leave the mountainous ridges of North Burma and enter the central plain, they regain control of north-south lines of communications for the first time in three years. In mid-December, construction continues on the Lido Road, which has been taking 10,000 tons of cargo monthly to the North Burma front. As Allied columns drive for a juncture with the Burma Road, extension of supply routes keeps pace with offensive operations. The American-operated Bengal-Assam Railroad, a feeding line for the Lido Road, is now carrying more than double the pre-1944 tonnage for the Manipur and Northern Assam stations. Engineers prepare for heavier traffic on the Lido Road. American and Chinese engineers cooperate on surveying, clearing, grubbing, and grading for this secondary road. On 14th December, Brigadier General Louis A. Pick, Lido Road Supervisor, arrives at a road construction headquarters. He accompanies Major General W.E.R. Covell, commanding General SOS India Burma Theater, on an inspection tour. Further east, near Michinaw on 18th December, troopers of a cavalry regiment with all battle equipment packed on mules leave Camp Landis. This Mars task force unit headed south for Bamo crosses the 25-ton Ponton Bridge recently erected across the Irrawaddy River. At Bamo, shortly after its capture, General Sun Li Jen, commanding the Chinese First Army, accompanies General Sultan on an inspection tour. A light tank knocked out by Chinese gunners is among the Jap equipment viewed. A Jap caliber 50 anti-aircraft gun is examined at a collection depot. Jap gas masks are among the trophies. Commenting on the operation, General Sultan said, the Chinese infantry and artillery deserve the highest praise for knocking out Bamo, which I believe was one of the strongest Japanese positions in North Burma. Seized German film claiming to show Nazi action in the Baltic area. A Mark V Panther tank.
75 millimeter gun self-propelled on a tank chassis. One-ton half-track reconnaissance cars. Probably a 75 millimeter assault gun. A Mark III chassis propels this gun. A synthetic sequence edited by the Nazis to show how a Russian T-34 tank is trapped. The non-com is ready with a Panzerfaust, equivalent of our bazooka. knocked out T-34 tank, which may not be the same as previously seen, since here it is close to a damaged Russian SP gun. The Nazis identify these as Stukas dive-bombing Warsaw during the repression of the Polish underground last fall. Scene of a diving Stuka, first used in a Nazi film on the Battle of France. Hits on Warsaw last year are intercut with material filmed four years before. Inside liberated Paris, last vestiges of Nazi occupation are removed. Sections of the French capital's principal subway stations had been converted into factories making airplane parts for the Luftwaffe. Workmen break up the concrete which the Germans spread over six miles of the rail as flooring for the underground war plant. On the station platforms is the machinery used in this unique aircraft factory 300 feet below the street level. Parisian machinists dismantle the equipment which bears markings indicating U.S. design. The principal plants were at a point where three main lines meet at the northeastern outskirts of Paris. Once these workmen finish clearing the tracks and hauling out the cement and stone, normal operation will be restored on the Paris lines. First Army Front during the hours preceding the opening of the German counteroffensive. This action took place at Gersnick, Germany, 1500 yards west of Duren. Youthful Nazi soldiers surrender. German rear guards were being swept back toward the Ruhr River, and Lieutenant General Hodges' forces had opened strong attacks north and south of the Ruhr dams. Also enveloped in the pre-counteroffensive drive was the German town of Ech, two and one-half miles from Duren. Here, men of the 9th Infantry Division captured two German 120mm mortars undamaged. The smooth bore, high-angle firing, muzzle-loaded weapon is carried on its own trailer. Bipod, mortar tube, and base plate comprise the essential sections of the German 120. The base plate has four carrying handles and deep ribs which dig into the ground. A socket is provided in the base plate for inserting the tube. A chain and spring at the bottom of the bipod help absorb shock. Saddle and clamp are used to affix the mortar tube. This is the type of sight mechanism used with the German mortar. It fits into place on the bipod as shown. The bipod has an elevation screw with a crank handle. A hand wheel is employed with the traversing screw. This cross-leveling adjustment is another feature of the 120 mortar, which is fired by a lanyard-type mechanism, demonstrating the weapon's recoil.
comparing the 120 millimeter shell with an 81 millimeter projectile. Our 81 millimeter mortar and the captured German 120, which will now be used by American troops. At Garian's Vila, a knocked out King Tiger tank is put back into working order. With the help of a wrecker, the turret is forced into line by men of Company B, 129th Ordnance Maintenance Battalion, 7th Armored Division. The King Tiger tank weighs approximately 72 tons. It has 34 inch wide treads which spread the great weight over large area. Top speed, 20 miles an hour. Armor up to six inches thick. It mounts the vaunted 88 millimeter gun whose barrel is more than 21 feet long. The rebuilt tank will be used to familiarize our troops with the enemy weapon. Inside Strasbourg, principal French city of the Upper Rhine Valley. While on a mission to assess bomb damage at a Junkers engine plant, Air Force's cameramen make a general survey of the liberated city. Germans have always regarded Strasbourg as a German town. To control the city's estimated 25,000 male Germans and their families, strict measures are taken by Brigadier General Leclerc's French troops and other units of the U.S. 15th Army Corps. Allied air attack caused only slight damage to the 11th century cathedral. The 16th century clock will run after minor repairs. Past the cathedral on their way to a prisoner of war stockade go non-combatant Germans. Because of the large numbers of Nazis settled here since 1940, only the most notorious could be interned. Wreckage of the Junkers Aero Engine Factory one mile from the center of town. In 1940, the Nazis converted this former Ford plant to an aircraft engine repair depot. Later, manufactured power plants for the Ju-88. Between two and 300 engines were turned out here monthly. Last 27th May, 53 B-17s of the 8th Air Force dumped 130 tons of high explosive on this target in less than three minutes. Production of engines was halted and never resumed. scour the December breakthrough front and points behind the lines, pulverizing the enemy supply columns. For eight days, bad weather shielded the Nazi counteroffensive and von Rundstedt advanced free from air interference. Now the full power of every Allied air force in Western Europe is thrown against the Germans. Flak catches some of our aircraft, which leave a smoke trail as they fall. Incidents in the defense of Bastogne. Men of the 101st Airborne Division begin their march to the outskirts of the vital road junction town. The U.S. command had given one order, hold Bastogne at all costs. To this end, the 4th Armored Division also moves up, and along with other units, make sure that besieged Bastogne holds firm. Supplies for the Bastogne defenders brought in by trains of C-47s from bases in Britain and France. A total of 850 missions are flown by the transport planes to provide the isolated troops with ammunition, food and medicines. Prisoners are marched by as the planes arrive. This airdrop is in the nick of time. During the first days of the battle, the Germans had captured our garrison's complete surgical outfit, as well as a quartermaster and ordnance unit. By 28th December, General Patton's forces had succeeded in lifting the siege at Bastogne. The 82nd Airborne Division, which defended positions around Stavolo and Stumon when the Germans broke through, is ready for new thrusts. Brief services are held for men of the 504th Parachute Infantry before they go into line. Moving up. The 82nd participated in the Netherlands campaign last September and earlier saw action in Sicily, Italy and Normandy.
German heavy equipment, knocked out by the 82nd without support of artillery or tanks. Many towns south of Stavolo fall to the 82nd as they help compress the Belgian bulge. southern side of the salient, a march through snow-covered forests and over steep hills is made by a battalion of the 35th Infantry Division. This maneuver in the Zawa River section is aimed at outflanking the town of Bétlange on the Belgian-Luxembourg border. The trek coincides with the halting of von Rundstedt's progress along the entire front. <laughs> 